In this lecture series, we are going to be studying macroevolution. That is the big evolutionary changes that can lead to the production of new species and the diversification of life. So you've already learned about microevolutionary processes, natural selection, artificial selection, mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, assortative mating. All these different processes accumulate in species over time and eventually can lead to such uh, differences that you end up with the production of new species, although that's not necessarily the goal, but that's one thing that can happen. So in this first segment, we're going to be talking about some pieces of evidence for macroevolutionary change, evidence that shows that it's these little microevolutionary processes that may have led to the diversification of life on Earth. And I stuck here on this first slide, this cute little guy here. This is not a snake. This is the slender glass lizard. And you see, it looks like a snake, yet he has some legs coming out of his body. So he's actually a lizard. And, um, you know, how did these things come about? Why does he look similar to a snake? Could a snake and, a, and this lizard have shared a common ancestor? So we'd be amiss if we didn't start our discussion of macroevolution without a discussion of camouflage and mimicry. And I could spend a whole course just talking about camouflage and mimicry. Camouflage, of course, is when an organism blends in with its background, and so it becomes hard to see. And mimicry is when the organism mimics something else in its environment. And uh, if you look around here, of course, we've already talked about the peppered moths and how within the same species you have ones that are lighter colored and camouflage against lichen on light-colored trees and dark ones which uh, blend in with um, dark backgrounds like those affected by soot from human industry. So we've already talked about how you can get those morphotypes, those body types evolving, but check out some of these other guys. These are insects in all cases here. Um, you know, this right here, he's one of my favorites. That's the orchid mantis. And he's evolved to look so similar to the orchid flowers that he lives on. And not only does he look like them, he acts like them. He kind of like quivers in the wind. And so look at his legs. I mean, same color, same kind of shape as the petals of the orchid flower. Amazing. And check this guy out. There's your insect right there. That is a katydid whose body looks just like the leaves that he sits on. Beautiful. Another mantis, another praying mantis who looks like dead leaves that he sits around. This guy is so amazing. There are actually multiple species of this guy. This is the green hawk moth caterpillar lives in um, the rainforest. He is not a snake, but he sure does look like one. That is a caterpillar, a cute little cuddly, completely harmless caterpillar, but he's a tasty morsel for, for some birds. And so when he gets startled by a bird, he actually drops down. And what you're looking at is his belly, the underside of him, and his tail end, which puffs up and reveals two dark spots that look like eyes. And then this particular species, he'll actually move back and forth and hiss like a snake. Awesome, huh? That would scare me if I was a bird. Um, now, other species within the same family actually don't look quite as much like a snake. They look sort of like a snake. Um, so you can see as you go through all its cousin species, it actually, you almost see a, a evolutionary progression towards more and more snake-like looks. Uh, these guys are so cool. <laughs> and I can't pass up this one. You might say, what is that? Why is she putting a picture of bird poop on the slide? Well, he's not bird feces at all. He is, in fact, you guessed it, a caterpillar that happens to mimic bird poop. Because if you look like bird poop, the birds probably won't mess with you. Awesome, huh? So we can ask ourselves, how did these amazing adaptations arise? What evolutionary processes were involved? And how over a macroevolutionary time scale did these changes lead to production of new species? So... Everything that we've learned goes towards what's called evolutionary theory, that the same processes that we've learned about that cause evolutionary change within a species can also accumulate and be responsible for change among species and therefore diversification of life over three and a half billion years. In other words, in the three and a half billion years that life has been around, all species have derived from a common ancestor using these microevolutionary processes. So let's um, look at where we're going to go in introducing some of the macroevolutionary pieces of evidence. 
Um, there's so much evidence all around you. Darwin recognized this. He said, all you have to do is open your eyes and look out at nature and you will see signs of evolution. So um, for example, let's uh, take a look at three common levels of comparative studies among organisms that tend to show evidence for macroevolution. So um, we're gonna be looking at comparative morphology where we're gonna look at the body structures of different organisms within groups and seeing how there's so much evidence that they evolved from a common ancestor. Um, so morphology means body type. And if you ever take a comparative uh, vertebrate evolution course or comparative anything course, it is just the most amazing study you'll ever see. You can dissect species within a group and trace where tissues and bones and muscles and nerves and every part of a body of an organism, how you can trace the similarities among them in different groups and find out where the common ancestor that gave rise to those traits is. So, um, for example, we're going to be looking at things called atavistic and vestigial structures. Those are amazing. Uh, we're going to look at comparative embryology, where by studying embryos in different species, you can see how traits arrive from a common ancestor. And genetic morphologies. This is the new, new kinds of stuff out there that all the biotechnology we have now has allowed us to actually go and look at the genes, look at the amino acids, look at the proteins, and figure out where these things originated from. This is like Frankenstein come alive now. It's awesome. Okay, so let's get started with looking at comparative morphology. Um, and let's just take a look at our hands. So if you look at vertebrates, that's organisms like us with backbones, and you look across at some of these different guys, you can trace the exact same bones within the limbs. So the most one that's probably familiar to you is us, the human. So if you take a look at our arm and hand, you notice that up at the top, above the elbow, we have the humerus bone, okay, you know, it attaches to our shoulder, everybody knows that, right, down to here. And then in our forearm, we have two bones, the radius and the ulna, okay, that make up this forearm right here. We have our wrist bones and we have our finger bones, and if you take an anatomy and physiology class, you'll learn the names of each one of those. So anyway, one bone, two bones, a bunch of little bones, and fingers. Take a cat, for example. Same bone here, humerus, radius ulna, wrist bones, finger bones. You're like, what happened to their thumb bone? Their thumb bones are right there. Tick da da becomes the dewclaw. But then you look at a bat. Well, a bat is also a mammal. And same thing, humerus. Um, and you're like, okay, well, I only see one bone there. So there's been a loss of the second bone here. Still wrist bones and finger bones. And you're like, why does a bat need finger bones, considering it flies? Hmm. Or a porpoise, a dolphin. One bone, two bones, wrist bones, finger bones in a flipper. And a horse, one bone, two bones, where the second bone has been, the ulna has been greatly reduced there, wrist bones, and one finger, basically the middle finger, has become the hoof. Okay, so, you know, you're like, why do all these vertebrates have such similar bones? Well, if they shared a common ancestor that gave rise to this, that would make sense. And you're like, okay, that's, that's the wrist, the hands, the arms. What about the rest of it? But, um, yeah, here again, a bat's wing, a human hand. And the stamp here even gives credit to just the amazing diversity of life and how we shared a common ancestor. So here's a bird where you see these different bones here, bat, porpoise, horse, human. But this is true of any bones in the body that you look at. So if you look at the skull bones, the skull is actually not like one bone. It's made of a lot of different bones. And you can trace each of these little bones to all the different vertebrate species you can get your, your hands on. So we got a whale over here. Um, we got a turtle, I think this is a crocodile, uh, here's the human, here's a fish, a pigeon, a frog, a dog, and if you look closely, and I'm not going to take the time to go through every single one of these bones because we'd be here forever, but you on your own can go ahead and see if you can trace individual little bones in all these different species. You know, start with the human, start with the parietal bone, which is right here, find the parietal bone in this alligator, or I guess it's a caiman actually, find it in a whale, find it in a turtle, find it in a fish, etc. You know, same thing with the zygomatic arches. 
Same thing with the frontal bones, um, the nasal bones, the temporal bones, every little bone you're gonna be able to find in all these different species, just modified depending on what the adaptations of that particular species were. For example, the frontal bones of us are nice and, you know, almost vertical, shallow, because we need a nice strong forehead. But if you're a whale, those frontal bones have been elongated, forming the upper part of your snout. So um, fascinating if you ever get to take a comparative class, you'll love it, it's just awesome. Uh, here's in a little bit larger view for you. So here's a turtle um, and here's a dog. And so again, like here's the parietal bone of the dog, here's the parietal bone of the turtle. Uh, you can go ahead and look in a frog. You know, here's the maxilla of a frog, here's the maxilla of a turtle, Here's the maxilla of a dog. Here's our maxilla right here. And we have an iguana. So anyway, if you want, you can take a marker on your PowerPoint printouts and go ahead and color code to match these guys up. It's kind of a fun thing, but it's really an evolutionary study. So again, this is a piece of evidence for macroevolution because the idea is if we shared a common ancestor, you're going to see the same structures still retained in so many of these different species, but slightly modified depending on the need of that particular species. And in some cases, you'll get structures lost or gained over evolutionary time, but overall, you'll see these same things just keep popping up, and it's, it's really fascinating. So not only can we compare the bone structures among species in a group, like for example, among all the vertebrates, but every single little thing, blood vessels, nerve cells, tissues, you name it, muscles. Um, so just as a, an example, um, and I think of this one because once I dissected a shark where you open it up and you open up the body cavity and you find the liver, of course all vertebrates have livers, and you'll see that there's this little itty bitty thin membrane that connects the liver to the body wall and that's called the falciform ligament. I mean it's just this little clear thing. You're looking at it right there. Whether it's a human, a chicken, a shark, a frog, a whatever in the vertebrate category, you're going to see that same exact ligament there that connects the liver to the body wall. Um, and everything, everything around there too. That's just one example. So, you know, if you, why would all these species have the same structures if they were each created individually? it seems to give evidence that we all descended from a common ancestor and so you've had modifications as species have come about since then. So um, again, fascinating to look at comparative morphology as evidence for macroevolution and the diversity of life. But this is only one piece of evidence, keep that in mind. But this by itself is pretty good evidence that all species descended from a common ancestor. But there's so much more evidence. Like, let's take vestigial structures or vestigial characteristics. These things are so cool. 